Dendrobium Roy Tokonaga. Because mine happens to be in bloom, I wanted to talk about it a little bit more, share my experiences with it. But first of all, let me just get the fandangle nerdy stuff out of the way. Being in the Latoria type of dendrobiums, or the New Guinea type orchid, it is a cross between the Dendrobium Johnsonier and Dendrobium atrovialaceum. One of the main features of this orchid is its extensive, extensive blooming time. Usually it begins to bloom at around November, and rumor has it that it will bloom for six months. Well, I can say that the blooming time is extensive, yes, but what I can't say is six months, not in my climate. I am in southern Spain, and I do believe as the temperatures warm up, the blooms do start to suffer. Let me say three months at a minimum, maybe four. But we'll have to wait and see what this one does. It takes forever for the buds to open. If I say I get a spike starting November, that's great. And then the spikes will start to open early March. That is a long time for spikes to develop. But then again, it goes hand in hand with a long blooming time, which is also wonderful. So here I am now with nine spikes on my Roy Tokonaga. And some of the apexes have already bloomed out, but they're giving me more spikes within the same apex. So that's another nice thing about this one. Not only do the blooms last a very long time, but you can get several spikes out of the same apex. She is not fragrant. But when you've got blooms like this, sometimes, you know, you can forfeit a little bit when it comes to fragrance. So I'm going to try and get in a little bit closer. I always struggle filming this orchid. It is a cloudy day, believe it or not. And I am still getting white out on the images. So I do apologize. Unfortunately, I'm going to have a super sunny day tomorrow. <laughs> and I say unfortunately, but this is the day that I wanted to film her just to make sure that it's not going to be a complete whiteout and we can at least appreciate a little bit of the blooms. So being Latoria types, they have a very, very fine base. And that is sometimes a little bit concerning when it comes to possible rot. The new growths, when they come out of the apex, there shouldn't be anything wet or, or too soggy down there because they can rot away. However, here in southern Spain, I do not have a lot of humidity for eight months of the year. And that is what works in my favor when it comes to the new growths because normally my leca on the top of the pots, it is very dry. So in this case, I do not mind a dry top layer the roots are not the kind of roots that just start crawling out all over the surface and have to find their way into the pot. They just dive straight in. But you can see how wrinkled my canes are. So that is a little bit of a concern considering that she blooms so long. She is exerting a lot, a lot of energy for these blooms from the growth of the spikes to actually blooming out. And for that reason, I fertilize her quite heavily, even during the winter months while the temperatures are low because of the energy that she has to exert into getting those bloom spikes to form and not abort. And still, you can see that the wrinkles of the pseudobulbs are quite extensive. Now, when I say that I'm concerned, it's only just an observation on my part, making sure that the health of the orchid is never compromised. I see her as healthy. She is pot bound. She got a vigorous repotting last year. The roots are extremely delicate. They are like glass. So if you ever intend to have a Roy Tokonaga and you get her in or you need to repot, you will find that the roots just split at the, at a, the slightest touch. But I wouldn't worry so much because within four weeks, five weeks, she was root bound again. So this orchid doesn't depend on having to have new roots in order to thrive. It will chuck out roots if the roots are damaged and they are a branching root system, which is 
very, very comforting to know. So when I say I'm a little bit concerned, I'm not concerned because I'm scared that the roots have failed. It's just that she has got so much going on on the bloom front that I'm concerned that my greed wanting to enjoy these blooms, I may need to start thinking about taking one or two of the bigger spikes off so that she doesn't get too depleted before the hot climate arrives, which is not stressful for them. They can take really hot temperatures, but I, you wouldn't want to push it to an extent that you forfeit the health of the orchid. And that is my thought process in why I'm a bit concerned and I will be monitoring very closely how these bigger canes are performing for the next coming weeks because of the massive spikes they have on top. Some of my smaller canes in the back have only one bloom, so they are not as deteriorated in the canes. The cane is looking much, much healthier where there's only one bloom. And you can see that I'm actually getting two new growths coming out already. So that is, the vigor of this orchid is incredible. It is extremely rewarding in my eyes. I have this little cane back here quetched behind the other one because I want to kind of contain it, maintain it in the pot. That's why that one is forced a little bit. This cane is helping me. I have a support in case I need to train the new growth. I rarely use it. More often than not, I use light in order to make sure that the canes, the new growths come in and start to grow upright and into the pot. In this case, for now, she is facing me like this in the blooming alley because that's her pretty side. So this cane right here, I'm watching it, it gets morning sun, but then the sun goes around behind her from the south, comes in from the south. So I'm, I'm, I think I'm gonna be okay with training this growth right here. But again, no need to really, really panic about these orchids because they're extremely robust. They can take a lot of beating from where they come. They tolerate really hot, dry climates, but they also need a lot of humidity. And as I cannot provide the humidity in my climate, I get about 30% humidity for eight months of the year. I like the grow method of the Lekka with self-watering because there's a little microclimate going on around the orchid in the pot. And for that reason, I have her in this setup, plus she is extremely thirsty. I fill the reservoir up probably coming up now every three days because of her blooms. Even though my temperatures aren't that high and that radical at the moment, she is a drinker. And with each watering prior, I flush through the pot using the mask as my measure twice with plain RO water. And then I just fill the reservoir with 300 parts per million of fertilizer. So she gets flushed at least once a week, if not twice. And you can see that there is no mineral buildup on the surface of this Lekka at all. That's how hungry she is. I've had her now for three years and I have not been disappointed at all with the performance of this orchid. In the winter, she has to tolerate in my climate at least 15, 16 degrees Celsius. She lives indoor with me. Supposedly, they can live outdoors as well, but my temperatures in the winter drop to five degrees Celsius. And I think that is just cutting it a little bit close. Not all the time, not for a long time, but if there's a niggle in the back of my mind, then I prefer to err on the side of caution. And I just bring her in because I do have the space for her. When it comes to light, I have to be extremely careful because I have a lot of light. When I talk about bright shade, that is uh, a lot of bright shade. I mean, that is sunlight in the morning, probably for about two, three hours, not much. And then behind a shade curtain for the rest of the day and no afternoon sun, especially in the summer. This orchid, even though she is robust, there is a limit to how much light she can tolerate without burning the leaves. My biggest pest problem has recently been what I was always told was a moth larvae, a small caterpillar that damages the underside of the leaves and takes away the tissue. And it very much looks like either spider mites, but it is not. 
For two years, I've been struggling against this pest. It hasn't worked. And I believe that my garden center has misdiagnosed these symptoms. They said it's moth larvae, and I believe it is thrips. I have never seen thrips on this orchid, but they are evasive little pests. But this is exactly the symptoms and the signs of thrips. So I've been battling a pest that I didn't know I had with a product or a sticky pad of moth pheromones that did absolutely nothing for the thrips. And I never got a moth ever landing on that sticky pad either. So it didn't work either for the moths that I was supposed to be attracting and eradicating. Now, finally, I think I'm, going, I'm treating for thrips and I'm getting ahead of the game and I'm using a garlic infused alcohol, 70% alcohol infused with garlic. And I'm spraying as a preventative measure, my new growth already, because at this point in time, history has proved that the thrips or whatever it is, is already trying to consider my new growths as lunch. So far, my growths are clean and I'm really pleased about that very, very pleased. So this garlic stuff is working so far and fingers crossed, it will continue to work. So here's the thing. The Care Collabs are doing great. And I really, really was hoping I could do a Care Collab with Roy Tokonaga as the feature orchid. I don't know anybody who has a Roy Tokonaga. So if you see this video and you have a Roy Tokonaga and you do videos and upload to any kind of social media, doesn't have to just be YouTube, would you please, please get in touch with me so that we can then do the future updates and care collab videos on this orchid together. I would really, really appreciate it. After all the care collabs, it feels so strange to be doing a care video of my own on my own. So please get in touch with me. My email is in the description below if you have this orchid and you want to join in on future updates on how she progresses, where you're living, a different setup, and what your experiences are. I would appreciate it. And then we can share it to the orchid community wherever they may be. The only thing I want to just add quickly, I have had no problems with mealybugs here. I know that mealybugs can be an issue, especially when spikes develop. I don't have mealybug problems here with this one. I don't have scale problems either. It's just, I believe, thrips. That's what I think it is. So I really appreciate your time. Sorry for the background noise. It's that time of year. Everybody is on the move and getting going. Thank you so very much for watching. Have yourselves a wonderful day and please continue to stay safe. Take care. Bye.